the halo surrounding the head of the Justinian proclaims his semi-divine status as Byzantine Emperor. So the Byzantine Empire reached its height under Justinian, whose generals seized Italy from the Ostrogoths and Roman Africa from the Vandals. And besides holding Greece, Asia Minor and Egypt, Justinian dreamed of recreating the old Roman Empire. His own empire began to crumble only three years after his death, when the Lombards became a 200-year struggle to wrench Italy from the Byzantines. Eventually both lost to Charlemagne. The Arabs also attacked Byzantium, fired with enthusiasm by their new religion of Islam. Emperor Heraclius used Greek fire to repel their attacks on Constantinople, but Syria, Palestine, Persia and Egypt fell to them. And under the Macedonian dynasty, Byzantium's frontiers expanded to the Euphrates and into Bulgaria. Bulgar and Serb attacks in the north ceased when Byzantine missionaries converted these Slav peoples to Christianity. Russia too was one for the Orthodox Church when a sister of Basil II married Prince Vladimir of Kiev in 989. So in 1071, Seljuk Turks from Central Asia chased the Byzantines back across Asia Minor, and when the Normans took southern Italy and Sicily by 1130, Byzantium shrank to Greece and western Asia Minor. The most cruel blow came in 1204, when fellow Christians from the west interrupted their journey to fight Muslims in Palestine, and seized and looted Byzantium instead. Although the dying empire tottered on for another 250 years, it was reduced to less than 1,000 square kilometres. Church and state struggled for supremacy over an empire whose population had fallen to only 60,000. Across the narrow waters of the Golden Horn, the Ottoman Turks had replaced the Sajuks and their leader, Sultan Mehmet II. Saw Constantinople as a monstrous head without a body. And in 1453, 100,000 Turks laid siege to the city for six weeks. Finally, they attacked across the Golden Horn, and the last Byzantine Empire died, bravely defending Constantinople as it fell. What's fascinating as well is how hundreds of years of empire are summed up in a page. It's, it's interesting, isn't it, if you think about the times that we live in. Are we part of some sort of empire? Maybe not geographically, but digitally, information-wise, or and how these ways of living and cultures can pop up and disappear over long periods of time that don't seem that long when you look back. So the golden age of the Tang and Sung dynasties saw an expansion of trade and the flowering of art and literature, crafts and technology. Chang'an was the world's largest city, with a population of well over one million people. So this is Tang, China. It's smaller than the Han Empire, but added its capital, the world's largest city. And this Tang figure is typical of the finer pieces of ceramic ware at the period. So after the Han Dynasty fell in AD 2020, China remained disunited until the nobly born Yang Jian established the Su Dynasty. He began an ambitious reconstruction drive, pressing millions of peasants into forced labour. Nearly half of the labourers conscripted to rebuild Luoyang were worked to death, and in consequence the peasants became bitterly hostile to the regime. Yang Jian's son murdered him to inherit the throne, but lost prestige when he tried and failed to conquer Manchuria and Korea. The peasants took to arms and Sioux soldiers deserted the dynasty. Then Li Yuan, a Sioux army officer, seized Zhang An and became the first Tang emperor. Tang armies then conquered Manchuria, Korea, Mongolia, Tibet, Turkestan to build an empire that extended from the Caspian Sea to Korea and Vietnam. By the mid-700s, most of the border regions were lost, and discontent again brought peasant revolts that weakened the dynasty. When Chu Wen, warlord of the Huanghe region, usurped the throne in 907, China disintegrated. The empire became reunited with reduced territory under the Northern Song, who set up their capital at Kaifeng near the Huanghe in north-central China suffered perpetual attacks from the north, especially from the new gen of Manchuria, who founded the Qin Kingdom in 1115. When the Qin took northern China in 1127, the survivors of the Song family fled, 
south to establish the Southern Song Dynasty. Its capital, at first at Shangxu, was later moved to Hangzhou. The plundering kin massacred or enslaved the Chinese, and when the Mongols invaded China in 1211, the northern Chinese welcomed them as liberators. Southern Song unwisely allied itself with the conquering Mongols to destroy the kin on the condition that they'd reoccupied kin territory south of the Huang Ho. But the Mongols cheated them out of the fruits of victory. When Song troops made for Luoyang, their Mongol allies treacherously opened the dikes of the Huang Ho and drowned them. Then the Mongols advanced into southern Song China and established the Huan Mongol dynasty. So with the Tang dynasty, China entered a golden age between 618 and 907. Its capital Chang'an became the world's biggest city. Learning from mistakes made by their predecessors in the short-lived Su dynasty of 581 to 618, the early Tang emperors tried to improve the lot of the peasants without antagonizing their powerful landlords. The peasants were demanding a redistribution of land. To appease both factions, the emperor gave them the territory that had gone to waste during the Sioux Civil Wars. They kept rents and taxes within reasonable limits and avoided taking men for forced labor during busy periods of the farming year. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. Even so, they managed to uh, cut new irrigation ca canals, improve the quality of destroying locusts. Um, sorry, not improve the quality of destroying locusts. They improved the quality of livestock, grain, and textiles, and they wiped out crop-destroying locusts. They developed water transport to bring trade directly into the new towns that sprang up alongside the riverbanks. Foreign trade also expanded. Nomads in the north brought furs and skins strapped on horses or camels to the border towns. Caravans from Central Asia and further west carried jade, carpets and other commodities into Tang China. Arab and Persian ships sailed to the ports of southern China loaded with drugs, gems, pearls, spices and other luxuries. The foreign ships carried away bronze mirrors, ironware, porcelain, silk, tea. Trade stimulated the demand for money, and each year the Tang government put into circulation another thousand tons of copper coins. Town planning was a feature of Tang China, so from Chang'an, good roads led to Hobei, Hubu, Kansu, Shantong, and Sichuan provinces. Luoyang stood at the hub of the Grand Canal, and the great trading city of Yangzhou stood at its confluence with the Yangtze Giang. Guangzhou, Canton, became the leading seaboard. The Song Dynasty heralded China's Silver Age between 960 and 1279. Song China was a weak military power compared with Tang, but to compensate it became the world leader in military technology, and one of its achievements was the development of the use of gunpowder, which had been discovered by the Tang. Here's a large blue and white bow characteristic of ceramic wares of the Ming Dynasty. Contrasting sharply with the finer but plainer Song ware, Ming blue and white was widely copied in Japan, Persia and Southeastern Asia. Shipped to the Netherlands, it inspired the Dift Porcelain of Holland. Because we see this everywhere in Europe, this type of ceramic ware as a result. This picture here shows part of the Rainbow Bridge from Chan Si Suan's the Silk Scroll Painting, the Qingming Festival on the River. It's fairly representative of the Song Dynasty style. So the greatest of the Huan emperors was Kublai Khan, who moved from the Chinese capital to Peking. Marco Polo, the Italian traveller, visited him there and returned to Europe with stories that made him a legendary figure in the West. Although Kublai Khan admired Chinese culture and ruled well, later Huan emperors were less able. And agriculture declined as waterways fell into disrepair and resistance to the Mongols increased. The Chinese rebels were eventually united under the leadership of the Red Turbans, who defeated several Yan armies. And in 1368, despairing of holding China, the Mongol army withdrew north of the Great Wall and the Wan dynasty crumbled away. Chu Yuanzhang, a poor peasant monk turned rebel commander, took Nanking and made himself the first Ming dynasty emperor. The Ming soon restored prosperity, but eventually they too came up against the irrepressible power of the peasants. A 17 years peasant war against the Ming dynasty whittled away China's internal strength, while from abroad.
abroad, the, Chinese, uh, the Japanese raided shipping and battled with China for control of Korea. When the Mongols conquered China, they made little impact on its cultural tradition apart from introducing northern drama and soon adapted Chinese ways. The Mongols did nothing to further the Chinese economy. When the Ming emperor succeeded them, this was their first task. Vast factories were set up to mass-produce porcelain, which began China's export, and then the Ming set to large trading fleets under Admiral Cheng Ho off to Vietnam, India, Persia, Arabia, and Eastern Africa. These voyages stopped abruptly when foreign traders proved willing to exchange their products with the Chinese in the Malayan port of Malacca. A constant hazard for the Chinese coastal settlements and shipping came from Japanese pirates, and the Portuguese soldier of uh, seizure in Malacca in 1511 convinced the Ming Emperor that European traders were no better than Japanese pirates. Such was the fame of Chinese porcelain in European markets that it became highly prized, and a number of potteries tried to copy it. The Chinese fashion of decoration on pottery became very popular. For some wealthy people, landowners and noblemen in England, copies were not good enough for them. They sent orders direct to China for complete dinner services and other pieces of the marvellous porcelain. They even went to the lengths of sending engravings such as book plates or miniature paintings of their family coat of arms and mottos to be placed on their custom-ordered porcelain. It took nearly two years for these heraldic orders to be completed and the porcelain delivered. When the drawing supplied to the Chinese were not sufficiently clear, some curious heraldry resulted. They copied what they thought they saw, even at times down to the instructions on the drawings which appeared on the final porcelain. And I think we have that today, don't we? We can see some hilarious posts sometimes on Reddit, for example, where people who, like cake makers, I think is quite a popular one, who literally copy everything, even the instruction on the cake design. It's very funny. Here's the world's oldest printed book, the Buddhist Diamond Sutra, the block printed in China in AD 868. Movable type printing, experimented with by the Chinese, was accomplished by the Koreans in the 1300s. And here are Mongol horsemen under Kublai Khan sweeping down China during the closing years of the enfeebled Song Dynasty. Although Kublai showed little mercy in conquering China, he respected Chinese culture and governed the country well. Indian Buddhism had reached China during mid han times, but it didn't become popular until the introduction of 520 of Chan, a more practical kind of Buddhism, which spread rapidly throughout the land. Buddhism did not replace Confucianism and Taoism, it coexisted with them. The Chinese combined all three religions together with the cult of their ancient deities into one integrated system of worship. Tang architects built Buddhist temples on a palatial scale, and their literature co um, concentrated on romantic tales and religious or supernatural themes. The dynasty produced China's two greatest poets, Li Bo and Tu Fu. In Song times, village groups gathered to hear priests read Buddhist tales known as Bian Wen. This began the tradition of storytelling to provide popular entertainment. Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy, and Buddhist saints caught the imagination of Chinese Taoist Buddhist artists who reached their peak in the Song Dynasty with the mountain and water landscapes that still symbolize China today. Chinese porcelain was also, uh, also reached unsurpassed standards with Song ceramic ware, and potters used colored gla glazes and often took their shapes and decorative motifs from Persian metalwork and Greek designs. During the long period of Ming China's internal collapse, the Nujin again threatened a northern border. As the Manchus, taking their name from Manchuria, they fought the Ming for 30 years. And finally, they took Peking and founded the Manchu dynasty between 1644 and 1911. The Chinese hated and despised their conquerors, and the Manchu retaliated by making them wear Manchurian clothing and tie their hair into pigtails as a badge of servitude. Chinese civilization stood still under the Manchus, and China slowly degenerated into a backward area, shuttered only by the illusion of a cultural and technological superiority that had actually been lost to Western Europe. Here we have the later Indians. So the philosophical teachings of Hinduism and Buddhism created an atmosphere in which art, literature and science flourished. 
the Ajanta Cave paintings, the Kama Sutra, Angkor Wat, and the introduction of yoga all date from this period. This map shows the Gupta Empire about 400, with its leading city of Ujjain and the Indianized civilizations that flourished in Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Malaya, and Indonesia during the next 1,000 years. Here we have a sari-clad woman weaving on a simple loom. The sari, a single length of unsewn material dyed in pleasing colours and patterns, symbolises India's unchanging cultural pattern. Here's a village barber, shaving his customer, who inspects the result in a mirror. The barber's trade was highly esteemed in the village, where he traditionally acted as matchmaker in marriages. So northern India entered a new era of civilization under the Hindu Gupta dynasty. Chandragupta II brought many small states into a confederation that extended from coast to coast. Gupta India saw the revival of Hinduism on a higher philosophical plane. With greater knowledge of anatomy, yoga developed its disciples seeking to achieve physical, mental and spiritual harmony. Art, literature and science flourished. India achieved in mathematics made possible that which made possible the later scientific revolution of the Europeans. So with the introduction of iron axes into Gupta India, vast areas of forest land were cleared and new villages sprung up. The peasants who settled there were converted by Hindu priests who brought them iron plows and scientific farming knowledge, as well as the supposed magical power to protect the village. But his monks had become too comfort-loving to serve these poverty-stricken rural areas which could not afford the costly temples and monasteries they deemed unnecessary. The Gupta period produced a wealth of outstanding literature. Sudraka, an early Gupta dramatist, described in the clay toy card the pleasures of middle-class people in the leading Gupta city of Ujjain. He caricatured the racy underworld life of thieves, gamblers, courtesans and political rebels. In the Kama Sutra of Vatsayayana, love was dealt with in an inventory way, innovatory way, and became both an art and a science. Kalidasa reflected the typical preoccupation of the Gupta dynasty writers in his Shakuntula, where he told the story of royalty, hermits, dense forests, and the intervention of gods and demons into human affairs. Now, although most of these Treasures of early India have been lost to several of the Buddhist Jain Hindu cave temples of Ajanta and Ellora, which were constructed during Gupta times, contain colourful wall paintings which have miraculously escaped decay. These portray the lively Gupta court life with dancers, musicians, acrobats, and magicians in attendance. The vigour and prosperity of Gupta India was recorded around 405 by the visiting Chinese Buddhist monk Fa Xian. So Indian mathematicians had clear concepts of abstract numbers. They developed algebra and trigonometry and devised the system of numbers now used by the whole world, the system of nine digits and a zero. The numerical system founded its way into Alexandria in their 500s, but it took another 1,000 years for it to reach Northern Europe and gain acceptance there. It's crazy, isn't it? The Iron Pillar of Delhi, a seven metres high length of rustless iron cast about 400, is a tribute to Indian metallurgical skill. The rustlessness of the pillar is due to the great purity of the metal, which could not have been achieved outside India until the mid-1800s. The astronomer Aryabhata also made a great step forward for science when his studies led him to the conclusion that the Earth was a rotating sphere moving around the Sun. Gupta India fell into decline by 500, when Hunas, or White Huns, invaded from Central Asia. Although the Guptas eventually pushed them back into Kashmir in the northwest, their efforts heralded the end of the dying dynasty. North Indian civilizations achieved a brief rebirth under Arja, who patronized Sanskrit literature through his favorite Buddhism. This divided loyalty costs, uh, loyalty costs from his life when jealous Brahmins, priests and scholars egged on his own soldiers to kill him. His death brought about the final disintegration of northern India. So in the early 700s, the Arabs took Sindh, the first Indian stronghold to fall into the Muslims' gradual but persistent infiltration into India. 
This was typified by the determination of Mahmud of Ghazni, ruler of Persia, Afghanistan, a fanatical Muslim known as the Idol Breaker, who raided India year after year until his death. He was followed by Qutb al-Din Aybak, a form of slave from Turkestan, whose conquests led to the setting up of the Sultanate of Delhi, and after this, most of India passed under the rule of the Mughals. The Mughals, of course, being um, Mongol. Mongol Muslims. So for 200 years, even if they did not fully conquer the south, where uh, several independent kingdoms flourished, notably the Cholas. Here is a Buddhist site sitting serenely in a niche in the vast built monument of Borodaba in central Java. Lovely this. It began as a natural earth mound around which the monument was constructed, and the terrace walls are carved with scenes depicting the lives of the Buddha and Buddhist saints. Borobuddha represents in stone the Mahayan idea of the universe. And here, of course, is something that is seen to this very day, ritual bathing in the holy Ganges River at Benares, which has been practiced by Hindus for perhaps 2,000 years or more. Bathing uh, begins before dawn and it's over by early morning, and Hindus hope that after death their cremated remains will be finally thrown into the Ganges. So Cambodia came under the influence of the Indians about AD 100 when the Kingdom of Funan was founded by Kandinya, a Brahmin known as King of the Mountain. Funan was the basis for the Buddhist Hindu Empire of the Kamas, uh, Kamas whose capital was built at Angkor in 808-802 and reached a population of a million. At the height of its achievement, the empire was ruled by Jayavarman the Seventh who was famous for his highly sculptured temples and palaces. The Bayon was his most extravagant temple dedicated to the god Lokaswar, who combined four personalities, Siva, Vishnu, Buddha, and Jayavarman himself. The god was represented 200 times on the temple. The king's architectural excesses exhausted the Kaimas, and they eventually fell to the newly emerged Thai kingdom. Encouraged by Kublai Khan, the Thais constantly attacked Angkor and sacked it in 1431. The Khmers retreated and abandoned their fabulous capital to the jungle. Several Indianized kingdoms grew up in Malaya and Indonesia, especially the empire of Srivijaya. This spread from Palembang in southern Sumatra in the 600s to control most of Malaya by 775. Java too was Indianized by the Silendra dynasty, who in the late 700s built the Borobudur, a huge Buddhist stupa or monument in central Java. And when the Silendra lost Java, they took over Srivijaya, but their power waned by the thousands, and the empire disintegrated. Nearer the mother country, the Indian Dabuljala kings invaded Buddhist Sri Lanka, where they introduced Hinduism. If you like these times, both actually that we've just mentioned there, the Srivijaya period in Indonesia and also um, India during this period are both um, explored in my Relaxing In series, where we travel around time and the world to explore different times and guided relaxation. I'll finish this episode with the Arabs. So Muhammad's teachings and the Arabian Nights of the Caliph of Baghdad lie at opposite ends of the Islamic cultural spectrum. What's often forgotten is the great Arab contribution to medicine, the physical sciences and literature. So emerging from the Arabian Desert in AD 632, the Muslims won a great empire. This is a huge extent in 945. Here's a bustling spice market in Cairo that still retains the character of the past. So the outside world knew little about the Arabs until the 600s, when, fired with the further of their new religion of Islam, they swept out of the sands of Arabia into the more fertile regions of Asia, Africa, and Europe. Within a century, they conquered and converted to Islam an area larger than the old Roman Empire. They absorbed the learning of the ancient world, and later passed it on to the Europeans. They evolved unique styles of art, and for several centuries led the Western world in cultural attainment. The Arab 
Islamic civilization began dramatically in 622 as the result of a single incident in the life of one man, Muhammad. So Muhammad, who we all know of course, an orphan, was brought up by his relatives in Mecca, a wealthy town standing at the crossroads of the Arabian trade routes and a center of religious pilgrimage. The Arabs of that time worshipped the moon, many idols, and certain stones. The most sacred of these was the black stone housed in the Kaaba, a large cube-shaped building in Mecca. Not all visitors to Mecca worshipped the black stone. Some were Jews, Christians, or Mandaeans, and the many religious arguments that Muhammad heard made a deep impression on him. At the age of 25, Muhammad took employment as a caravan manager to Khadija, a wealthy widow of 40 whom he later married. Muhammad began to have visions in which he claimed that Allah spoke to him, and gradually he evolved a new faith, Islam. His demands were simple, give up the worship of idols and stones and submit to the one God, Allah. Few supported Muhammad beyond close relatives, some slaves and a merchant named Abu Bakr, because most Meccans saw their prophets bound up with the continuance of the pilgrimages to the Kaaba. They believed that Muhammad's activities threatened their livelihood. One night, civic leaders sent soldiers to arrest him. Muhammad escaped in the darkness, accompanied by Abu Bakr. The Meccans put a price of 100 camels on Muhammad's head, but did not catch him. His flight from Mecca the Hegira is the most important event in Islam's history. From it dates the Muslim era. Muhammad and Abu Bakr first hid in a cave, then travelled on camelback 300 kilometers north to the rival trading town of Medina. Word had gone before and the Medinians accepted Muhammad's new religion and made him their ruler. In 630, Muhammad rode back in triumph to Mecca at the head of an army. He smashed the idols in the Kaaba, but by sparing the black stone, won the Meccans for Islam. When Muhammad died in 632, most of Arabia had been conquered for Islam. Mecca became the main religious center, while Medina remained the hub of political affairs. Here are beautifully illustrated Qurans, becoming one of the main features of Arab art because uh, Muhammad disapproved of betraying humans and animals. Muslim artists set their talents to devising pleasing geometrical designs and superb calligraphy, such as shown on this double page from a Quran. And the mirab a niche in the mosque wall must be accurately positioned. By facing it when they pray, Muslims can be sure that they are also facing Mecca. The mirab shown is the solidly constructed Hassan Mosque built in Cairo by the Mamluk rulers of Egypt in the mid-1300s. So at Muhammad's death, the faithful Abu Bakr, who was elected caliph, successor, humble as ever, he continued to sell his cloth in the marketplace of Medina, while his army commanders began a jihad in his name against the Byzantines in Syria. Abu Bakr outlived Muhammad by only two years. Umar, an early convert who at one time persecuted Muhammad, succeeded him and was in turn followed by Uthman, Muhammad's elderly son-in-law. Both men met death at the hands of assassins. Uthman's killers appointed Ali, also a son-in-law of Muhammad, as fourth caliph, but many took up arms against him, including Aisha, one of Muhammad's widows. Eventually, Ali took her captive on a battlefield where more than 12,000 Muslims lay dead. After five years as caliph, Ali too was assassinated. The caliphate at first passed to his son Hassan, but Ali's sworn enemy, Muawiyah, forced him to abdicate and founded the Umayyad dynasty, which ruled from Damascus, 661 to 750. So Damascus had been a Roman Byzantine city for 700 years. In Muawiyah's time, it took on a lively character that remained largely unchanged into the present century. Baggy trousered, turbaned merchants jostled in the narrow market streets with loose gowned Bedouin from Arabia. Veiled women peeped through high latticed windows into the traffic below where sherbet and sweetmeat vendors called their wares above the din. Harassed men whipped donkeys and camels into the bazaars, rich with the smell of spices, perfumes, and foodstuffs. The rooms of private houses surrounded courtyards in which stood fountains connected to the city's water supply. Lovely little visual there. Now below the caliph and 
Fatima's household were four classes, the Arabian Muslims, newly converted Muslims, Dimis, which were Jews, Christians and Mandaeans, and slaves. The converts included mainly Jews, Byzantines, Syrians, Persians and Egyptians who quickly adopted Arab ways but at a higher cultural level than the true Arabs. They eagerly married Arabs, served in the government and became the most fanatical Muslims. The Dimis enjoyed considerably more freedom than the slaves who came mostly from Spain, Africa and Central Asia. The converts led the way in Arab medicine, philosophy, mathematics, science, art, literature, even language. Because of their origins, they borrowed heavily from higher civilizations. Converts rebuilt the Christian Basilica of St. John in Damascus, which became the magnificent Umayyad Mosque. Here, of course, is the black-draped Kaaba in Mecca, the holiest shrine in Islam, which was the center of worship long before the time of Muhammad. It houses the sacred black stone. Muslims from every part of the world are expected to visit the Kaaba once in their lifetime. They are then respected as hajis or pilgrims. So I understand this is um, a square that is it's draped in um, draped in livery, but um, inside isn't. So is the is the stone like a large stone? Is it the small stone? I'm intrigued to know what's inside there. Does anyone know? If you're familiar with the subject, please let us know in the comments below. I'd be fascinated to know. And of course, oases were the settled homes of the early Arabs and their halting places for desert traders and nomads. The essential thing that an oasis must have is water. The picture shows Nefta, an oasis of southwestern Tunisia that grew into a town. Islam spread through the desert from oasis to oasis before it was established in the cities of the Mediterranean hinterland. So in Damascus, the stark Puritanism of the desert Muslims seemed out of place. The easy-going Caliph Mawia married a Christian, appointed non-Muslims to government posts, and honoured poets, a group abhorred and banned by Muhammad. The Umayyad court enjoyed music, song, gambling and drinking. Successive caliphs became more and more worldly, and Hisham neglected the empire for horse racing. His nephew Walid, who inherited an empire extending from Morocco to Mongolia, was atheistic, proud, and talented, but incompetent. The Damascus mob cut off his head in 744 and paraded it through the streets on a spear. Oh dear. The Umayyads tottered on for another six years until the rival Abbasid family mustered a large army in Persia, where people still mourn the murder of Ali. They attacked an alliance with a breakaway sect called the um, Shiites. In remembrance of Ali, the Abbasids and Shiites draped their soldiers' horses and camels in black and flew black banners. West of the Tigris, they defeated the Umayyads in a terrible nine days battle and swept into Damascus. Then, by a trick, they murdered almost the entire Umayyad family and set up the Abbasid Caliphate in the Sunnite tradition. The second Abbasid Caliph transferred the capital to the new city of Baghdad. For the next 500 years, nearby Persia dominated the character of Islam. By the reign of Harun al-Rashid, fabled Caliph of the Arabian Nights, Baghdad became one of the world's most splendid cities and the Caliph's luxurious palace rising to a height of 40 meters over the audience chamber most of the costliest furnishings in Asia. Harun's cousin's wife, Zubayda, studded her shoes with gems. Musicians, poets and other worldly guests of the royal pair ate sumptuous food from gold and silver containers ornamented with jewels. The wealthy merchants of Baghdad took to drinking alcohol and spent much of their time at the public baths or sports meetings. Granada, one of the showpieces of the Arab world, was the last part of Spain to be lost by the Arabs. The splendid courts of the lions in the dreamlike Alhambra Palace in Granada City incorporates the finest features of Arab architecture. It took 200 years to build and was completed shortly before all Spain was lost to the Christians. And here's a Mamluk soldier that wore, well, this is what a Mamluk soldier would have worn, a coat of mail in the early 1300s. They twice halted foreign invaders when all other Arab resistance had failed. The 
Muslims first turned to seafaring in Moawiyah's time, and under the Abbasids, Arab and Persian ships laden with drugs, gems, pearls and spices sailed to Tang Dynasty China and brought back a bronze mirrors, ironware, porcelain, silk and tea. The wharves of Baghdad's port on the Tigris extended for several kilometres, and their warehouses held a hundred imports from Arabia, Egypt, Africa, Syria, Persia, Central Asia, India, Malaya, China, Russia, and Scandinavia. The Arabs traded along overland camel routes. Their Arab ships did not use the square sail of the Europeans, but the Latin, a tall triangular sail that caught the wind on either side, yet to get the same edge forward. Diplomacy followed in the wake of trade, but an Arab envoy to the court of China ruffled court etiquette by refusing to count down to the Tang Emperor, saying that he bowed only to Allah. The Abbasids grew hungry for learning and promoted translations into Arabic from Greek, Persian, Sanskrit and Syrian works of science and philosophy. Gradually, Arabic became the central language of all learned people from Spain to Central Asia, where the Frank Emperor Charlemagne could just write his name. Harun al-Rashid studied translations of complex works. Through Arab scholars, the forgotten learning of the ancient world eventually found its way into the Latin books of medieval Europe. This is what I enjoy about going on this journey through history, is that often origins are things that you can take for granted. You discover where they've come from, and you can trace back the etymology of mathematics and science and all sorts of concepts that influence our lives to this day. So by 850, Arab scholarship flourished in its own right. Textbooks on medicine were written by Rays, Razes and Avicenna, and Al-Kindi wrote some 265 works on subjects ranging from optics to music. The Arabs were interested in more than the theory of medicine, and established pharmacies, hospitals and rural clinics. Learning from India, Arab astronomers made regular observations with accurate instruments by the 900s and built observatories near Baghdad and Damascus. Using the astrolabe, dial, globe and quadrant, the caliph's astronomer measured the length of a degree of the Earth's circumference to within 1% of accuracy. And one of the astronomer mathematicians about 1100 was Umar Khayyam, better known in his role as the free-thinking Persian poet. The Arabs also pioneered alchemy and chemistry, using the experimental method rather than the inadequate philosophical approach of the Greeks. Arab research proved fairly accurate, and was based on the patient collection and analysis of fact. Their weakness lay in failing to project the hypotheses from which they could draw scientifically based conclusions. The religious obligation for Muslims to make the Hajj pilgrimage to Mecca and to position the Murab in mosque so that worshippers faced Mecca inspired the study of geography. Al Masudi, one of many intrepid Arab travellers, visited places as far apart as Madagascar, Sri Lanka and China, questioning peoples of different religions and recording his findings. Astrology also promoted geography because astrologers needed to determine latitudes and longitudes. Using a translation of Ptolemy's geography, some 70 scholars, led by a mathematician called Khwarezmi, constructed a vast map of the earth and sky. Although Muslim merchants found their way into Africa, China and Russia, they feared to venture into the Sea of Darkness, the Atlantic. Here is a crusader knight engaging in a fight to the death with his Saracen counterpart in one of the many bloody battles for possession of the Holy Land of Palestine and Syria. Saracen became the general term for all those Muslims who fought the Crusaders. And also if they feared to um, venture into the, the Sea of Darkness, the Atlantic, would that mean that... Well, I suppose that their, their journey to, say, England or France wouldn't necessarily be the Atlantic, would it? The Atlantic is... They probably just realised how vast and massive it was, and as a result didn't reach America. Which makes the um, achievements of the Vikings to achieve, you know, was it Finland, you know, uh, reaching North America absolutely incredible, based on how far before this time was. So a complex 
system of Muslim law derived from the Muslim holy book, the Quran, and from hadith, which laid down the rules for political, social, and religious behavior. A Muslim's duties were contained in the five pillars of Islam. Hajj, pilgrimage, iman, faith, salat, prayer, psalm, fasting, and zakat, almsgiving. Here's uh, Arab trading boots. This one shown became a familiar sight in the Mediterranean and Arabian seas from the time of the Umayyad Caliphate onwards. This is a lovely astrolabe, a navigational instrument probably invented by the Babylonians, which remained vital to seamen for over 2,000 years. This Arab astrolabe was made by a master craftsman over a thousand years ago. So not all of the Umayyads died in 750. One, Abd al rahman fled western and became Emir of Spain. He transformed Spain into a land of spacious cities, laid out with gardens, and strove hard to weld the various peoples of the country. Arabs, Berbers, Goths, Iberians, Numidians, Syrians into one nation. Abd al rahman chose for his capital the ancient city of Corboda, where he built a palace with gardens and the great mosque, all in the Syrian style. He also built hundreds of smaller mosques, baths, and an aqueduct to supply the city with pure water. Cordoba soon grew to a city of 500,000, surpassed in culture only by Constantinople and Baghdad. In 929, Abd al-Rahman III took the title Caliph in opposition to the opposite family. Industry and trade boomed in Umayyad Spain. The court wainers, the leather workers especially, were world famed. The country also excelled in agricultural science, especially fruit growing. The hard currency coinage of Umayyad Spain passed freely throughout the Christian countries to the north. Cordoba became the center of learning, and its university, founded in the 900s, was known all over the world. The Caliph al Harun is said to have accumulated 400,000 books, more than 20 times as many books as then existed in Christian Europe. All North Africa fell to the Arabs in the 600s. At first, the Egyptians remained Coptic Christians, but later most converted to Islam to secure social and financial advantages. Arab migration into Egypt played an important part in forming the country's culture and religion. Karouan in Tunisia, founded as a sacred city in 670, became the capital of the Arab Fatimite dynasty in 909. This dynasty, founded by Ubaidullah, claimed descent from Muhammad's daughter Fatima. From Tunisia, the Fatimites took Libya and Egypt, founded Cairo in 969, and the Al Azhar Mosque and University in 970. Their dynasty lasted 200 years before falling to Saladin in 1171. In the 1000s, the Almoravides, Muslim Berbers, seized Morocco for the Arabs, then took over Umayyad Spain. Another Berber dynasty, the Almohades, took over in Morocco and Spain in the 1170s. So although the Abbasids never held Spain and lost North Africa and Syria Palestine to the Fatimites, the period 750 to 1055 proved to be a golden age. This was followed by a series of troubles, beginning when the Seljuk Turks attacked from Central Asia. In 1055, the Seljuk leader Tukril swept unopposed into Baghdad, and although he allowed the Abbasids to remain caliphs, Tukril dominated their empire as Sultan. Further west, the Tatha Fatimites successfully resisted the Seljuks, who set up their capital at Konya in Asia Minor. In 1092, after the death of their strong sultan, Malik Shah, they split into factions. By the late 1000s, several strong Christian kingdoms had been established, which resented the Muslim occupation of Spain and Syria-Palestine, and consequently Muslim-Christian clashes became frequent. The most important were the Crusades, fought about 1096 to 1291. The Crusaders took Jerusalem in 1099, but Saladin retook it for the Abbasids in 1187. The Abbasids' most terrible and final peril came when Genghis Khan began the Great Mongol Expansion. Having conquered northern China, he and his successors rode westwards into Russia and Central Europe. In 1258, Huluku, grandson of Genghis Khan, led the final assault that breached the walls of Baghdad. The Mongols poured into the starving city, murdered the Caliph, his family and officials, massacred more than half of Baghdad's two million people, and razed the city to the ground. Plague inevitably broke out, and 
once again effective resistance came from Egypt since 1252 under the control of the Mamluks. In Spain, the Christians pushed the declining Muslims ever southwards, and by 1276 only Granada remained Muslim. Although the great days of the Arabs were over, the Islamic religion continued to expand under foreign leadership. So Baghdad's checkered history reached its climax in 1258, as we just learned when Alagi, the grandson of Genghis Khan, laid siege to the city. Here's an illustration of it. So that's a truly fascinating in-depth look there at um, Arabic culture. I must admit I'm not as familiar as, with it as perhaps I should be, and this I think has acted as a great introduction or a jumping off point to learn about the fascinating inception of um, alchemy, medicine. This centre of learning seems truly fascinating to me, so perhaps we'll look into this topic in a little bit more detail in the near future. In the meantime, that draws to a close this episode of The Coming of Civilization. So I look forward to having you join me next time. But until then... <laughs>